Mm okay. Um, they didn't go to Kroger. Kids take care of each other. You had someone who were Shrove you were in charge of. Lily had Bobby. Susie had Betty Lou. But it's kind of funny because, you you know, like I said, you got people that got one kid and like, yeah, I mean, I need to clean my bathroom. Can you keep her a little extra? I'm like, put her in the plane then. Yeah, really. You know? Um, Los Angeles did. Cowboys lost. Awake, right? Thanks. It's because it's because of my eyes. I've had other people tell me that because of my eyes. So. Uh, we got a couple ties that have pink in it. That's about it. In the summer, in the summer I could. <coughs> that color <laughs> not, not to be confused with all the others that aren't salmon colored it's like welcome to specter color <laughs> So we're starting Romans 15 today, which means there's only two chapters left. <laughs> hmm. Four more years, huh? No, it was... We're getting there, though. Chapter 16, there's not, there's not a lot in there. Um... So we'll see how we'll see how how long we can stretch this out. See if I can get that two year mark. <coughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brother Dean. I'm glad I hope he's doing better. Um he had to go to the ER again the other day, so <coughs> hopefully he's 
hopefully he's doing a little bit better. So, is he going to be on this morning? No, I mean his. Well, technically, I guess I just asked him. Right? <clears throat> um, but uh, we're coming towards towards the end of Romans, which kind of kind of makes okay. What's next once we do get finished? And I've got a couple of ideas. Um, we'll see what we can do. I'm gonna try and see if we can get the uh, the four watches done and actually record it and it work. Fingers crossed. Um, and then what was the other one? The four trees. Was that, was that the other one? I think it was that we've tried before and it's never worked. So. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Well, good. So at least he's doing well enough. He'll be able to do that. So that's good. Um, <clears throat> so Romans chapter 15, uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 uh, to get us started. And then, then we'll go through uh, some things along, along with this. <clears throat> so uh, Romans chapter 15, start off in verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and to and not to please ourselves let every one of us please his neighbor for his for his good edification for even christ pleased not himself as it is written the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may, may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. Um, may we take to heart the information that you have here for us uh, and the application of the doctrine that we might... Uh, be able to fulfill these verses, to be able to build each other up um, until the time that you come back to take us back um, through, the, through, through rapture or the time that uh, our, our life here on this earth is, is complete, but that we might be able to live a life glorifying to you, uh, that you might receive all honor and glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, as we get down through Romans chapter 15, one of the things that we know as you go through scriptures, uh, Romans chapter 15 is not some complete new thought that has absolutely nothing to do with Romans 14, right? And we've talked about that before. The whole building block that we see in the book of Romans <clears throat> gets us to this point. Uh, in chapter 14, he's dealing with um, the weaker brother in the faith and the stronger brother, what we're supposed to be able to do to help one another out. And he's, he's continuing that through here. And then he brings in um, a, couple, a couple things... <clears throat> that should make us kind of pause for a second and think about who is it that is that is already given us or shown us what it means to be a stronger brother bearing the the burdens or the infirmities of the weaker brother so you know we kind of think about that when we look at verse one he says we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and in the context it's not Chapter 15, verse 1 is not its own little thing, right? We talked about that before. So in chapter 14, that's what he's dealing with is the stronger brother um, bearing the infirmities of the weaker. Now, when we talk about infirmities, <clears throat> the context here, what's the infirmity of the weaker brother? The infirmity isn't that they have a cold or you know, their back aches or anything like that. Most people, that's what they think of when they think of infirmities is, is that. Um, but what's the infirmity of the weak person here is what? They're weak where? In the faith. And that's what he says in chapter 14, verse 1, right? Him that is weak in the faith. So the infirmity there is they're weak in the faith. That body of doctrine that was delivered to and through the Apostle Paul. Right, and so that's that's what he's dealing with here in this context. So when we get down to chapter fifteen, verse one, he says, "We then that are strong ought to what bear the infirmities of the weak." <clears throat> and so when we take a look at that, go real quick to Romans chapter eight. 
<coughs> and this gives us a this gives us a good idea as well <coughs> um, how this how this actually works out. Um, <coughs> In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, yeah, verse 26, um, notice this, notice this real quick, verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, right? So what that Holy Spirit is going to do is help us in our infirmities, and notice he says, um, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So what was, what's the infirmity that the Spirit's helping us with specifically there is what? Prayer, Prayer right? And we've talked about that before. Um, one of the first things that goes when you start learning right division is the prayer because you stop, you stop praying for certain things because you've already got certain things, right? Um, you get to the point where in, in right division you find out that there's not a sin right now that God's trying to condemn you with or beat you down with or anything like that. So then you stop praying for um, those issues to go away, right? And things like that. And you start seeing, based on Romans chapter 5, that tribulation works patience and patience experience and experience hope. Right? And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. So we understand what those issues in life are, are designed, they, they prepare for us, in us, hope, right? And so then we stop praying for those situations to be taken away. And though, so then we start praying for what? Wisdom and knowledge and understanding of how to live through that, through peace, knowing that on the other side of that is going to be hope, and all that stuff builds up, right? So then we stop praying for that, okay? So then we find out, Hey, you've been forgiven of all trespasses, past, present, and future. So then we don't end our prayers with, Father, forgive us uh, for whatever sin that we have or whatever sin that we don't know that we have that we've committed uh, that I've forgotten about. All right? So we don't pray for those things. We, don't, we no longer pray for peace because we already have peace with God. Um, we stop praying for um, grace because we know that he's, he's able to make all grace abundantly towards all times having all sufficiency and all that stuff we don't we don't go and pray for um you know some special revelation from god <clears throat> because we know that he we have the complete word of god he's already given us everything that we need in the king james bible and there's nothing else that, that we need to add to that so we stop praying for those things and so then what we're left with is well what should we pray for well Fortunately for us, in Romans 8, 26, notice he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Right? There's some things that we ought to do, or ought to, more specifically, know. Right? There's some things that we ought to know how to do, and one of those things is prayer. And that's one of those issues that we deal with as we go through there. Notice he says, but the Spirit itself maketh the intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and he searcheth the hearts, knowing it, um, searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit already knows. We ought to know. And since we don't know, what he does is he kind of helps us out in that way by bearing part of that burden for us. Okay, so we see, we kind of see that's what's going on there. He helpeth, and that's what we're looking at here. He helpeth our infirmities. So when we're talking about bearing the infirmities of the weak, one of the infirmities is the prayer life. Uh, more specifically in Romans 15, it's the infirmity of the faith, of being weak in the faith, right? Not being built up to the point that they know some information. Um, <clears throat> one of the things when we think about this stuff is... Um, you know, when we come across people that say something like, um, well, the Lord spoke to me this week. Well, how do we deal with that person? Do we say, no, God's no longer revealing himself through um, signposts and things like that or revealing himself through the whisper or the, you know. I was watching a guy on, on TV last week. I think it was last Sunday, a preacher, and he said, um, God spoke to me 
And that's still a small voice in my heart. And I'm like, no, he didn't. But when I, if, I, if I came across that guy, do I come up to him and say, no, God's, God's word's complete. He's not talking to you. And, and I'm going to make sure that you know that. <clears throat> what do we do? It's kind of it's kind of interesting. I noticed this morning Brian Ross posted that he's going to be going through some stuff, and he's talking about kind of the same things that we're dealing with here, but he's going through the book of First Corinthians, all right, and their Sunday morning service, and they're talking about the same thing. And his he had he posted two questions, and I don't have it up, or I would I would talk about those two questions. But the second one was, do we just go ahead and allow that person to go ahead and think that God's talking to him? Or do we come along and help them out with that? You help them out, right? Um, but what point do we say, okay, and the other question was, um, would we do that same way for unsaved people? Right, and I think it was something like that. And I, I, I apologize, Brian, if I misquoted you, but that was kind of the gist of it, right? Do we treat saved people the same way we do unsaved people when it comes to this type of stuff? Uh, and then the second one was... <clears throat> Do we just allow them to go and do whatever they want to? And the answer, of course, is no, right? And that's one of those issues that we talk about here. Because there's things that we ought to do based on knowing some stuff. The Spirit already knows it, and the Spirit's going to be working on our behalf specifically here to talk about prayer life, to teach us how to pray, right? And so then He knows the hearts. He's able to search the hearts and the mind of the Spirit uh, because He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. <coughs> There's things, according to the will of God, that He knows that we may not. And so what He's doing for us is helping us to pray according to God's will, even though we should know it, but we don't, and He's helping us to get to that point. And so what happens is we come to a verse and we say, okay, do I believe the verse or do I believe what I've been taught my entire life? And that's the issue. So then if I come to the point and I say, okay, I'm just going to believe what I've been taught my entire life and not do this, well, then you might go ahead and pray that um, your illness is taken away. There's something. Notice real quick. Go over to <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians <clears throat> or 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And you kind of, you kind of see this. Um, with Paul, as, as we continue through here, you kind of see this with Paul. And of course, we know Paul is our apostle. We know that he's our pattern. And we follow Christ by following Paul. So when we follow Paul, we're following Christ, right? Because Christ is really the ultimate pattern. But could we live up to what Christ did? No. But could we live up to how Paul lived through Christ? Okay. So notice 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And of course you all probably know what we're, what we're looking at here. Um, notice in verse 1. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me, seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So what did Paul do here? So he gets this thorn in the flesh, right? So he gets this thorn in the flesh. <clears throat> What's his response? What is, what is it that he does? <clears throat> In verse, verse 4 he says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it what? Depart, depart, depart. <clears throat> Notice, 
verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I rather glory. So what takes place is Christ comes along and says, My grace is sufficient. Okay? Now here's the thing. If you don't understand grace, then you're never going to get that verse. If we never get to the point where we understand what grace is, grace isn't what the majority of people out there is talking about. And we talked about this before. It's easier to define what grace is not than to define what grace is. Right? And so then, this was everything that God was able to do for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the only response that grace will accept is faith. Now, do you believe that Paul understood Old Testament scriptures? And do you believe that he probably knew something about uh, the miracles that Jesus Christ worked in his life? Do you think, by any stretch of the imagination, that the God of the Old Testament, God of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul could have said, hey, you took away some, some pains for people back there, so why can't you do it for me by faith? Could he have believed it? But notice, here's what's taking place. He asked three times that it depart. Notice Christ's response is, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Notice, most gladly, therefore, this is Paul, he changes his mind. All right, so Paul, three times saying, depart, take it away, take it away, take it away. Christ says, my grace is sufficient for thee. On the other side of that, notice what Paul's response is after that. He says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay? So then, on the other side, what's he say? He says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? Because he knows that God's grace is sufficient. And by faith, he's taking that and saying, I'm going to glory here, rather than asking you to take it away. Okay? Now, <clears throat> As we go down through here, he changes his mind. Notice in verse 10, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. How many people say that? <laughs> How many people, that, you know, people talk, talk all the time like, well, I've got this thorn in my flesh. And they never really understand what's going on. First of all, why was that thorn in the flesh given to Paul? Was so that what? Because of the amount of revelations that he had so that he wouldn't be exalted. That's why it was given to him. Well, if you think that you've got a thorn in the flesh, then don't you think the reason it would have been was because you're afraid you might be exalted? And a lot of people talk about those things to be exalted. And we were talking about that earlier, right? Misery loves company. You always, you always put stuff out. Well... This day's been this bad for me, and here's why, or, you know, whatever it may be. And people talk about, well, this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm going through. What did, what, when, at, at the end of this, what was, what was Paul's thought process? Notice, therefore I take pleasure in, my, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. Why? For Christ's sake. For when, I'm out, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glory. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind in the very chiefest of, of apostles, uh, chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. And then he goes on and talks about some of the things that confirmed him as an apostle. So he's saying, I'm not going to worry about that anymore. I'm dealing with this, and I'm going to glory there. Why? For Christ's sake. When I'm weak, he's strong. What takes place is, it's a change of a thought process. And what was in between that change was he understood, he learned something about grace. So through knowing something, he changed his mind. And his thought process was before, get it away, get it away, get it away. Here he's saying, I know, I just thought of that too. 
No, no, it's in my head forever now. <clears throat> so he's saying, get it away. Then, then Christ says, my grace is sufficient for thee. When we get to the point that we understand what that is, I forget who it was. Somebody, somebody posted a thing on, on Facebook. It was something like, just because you divide the Bible correctly doesn't mean you're a grace believer. But if you're a grace believer, you, write, you rightly divide the Bible. And I was like, I kind of like that. Because there's a lot of folks that rightly divide the Scripture. And I've, I've said this before. They'll draw a chart. They'll talk about the chart. They'll talk about the church is different from Israel. Uh, rapture is not in Matthew 24. They'll talk about some things like that. But they're not grace people. They're not a grace believer. They, they know how to write the divide, but they're not a grace believer because there's something that takes place through understanding the Bible laid out the way it's supposed to do and understanding it right, rightly divided, that what it produces in you is grace. And then you start living this stuff, not because you choose to, it's just because it just, when that book gets in us so much, that's what it dwells, and that's what comes out, right? And so then what takes place is, Grace believers have to rightly divide, but just because you rightly divide doesn't make you a grace person. I thought I saw that and I was like, I kind of like that. Because, I mean, that stuff's out there, right? So then my issue here is, is what I want you to notice is, what did Paul do? He changed his mind, all right? So what he, what he did was he repented. He changed his mind about his infirmities. Now, <clears throat> infirmities could have been the things that he's talking about in chapter uh, chapter 11 there but what other infirmities could he talk about well he's already talked about one of prayer and he's already talked about one of a person that's weak in faith so then what we should do is if we're weak in some position what do we do we glorify or we glory where we are because we know that we can get somewhere else all right and we understand that because it's by grace and understanding the Bible rightly divided that those things are going to then what? Once we get into the Bible a little bit more and we find out a little bit more about that and we get stronger in the faith, then we're no longer down here in this infirmity and we no longer have that infirmity. And okay, then we find out where we're lacking somewhere else. And, uh, and then we go through there. And it's for Christ's sake. The whole issue about that is, is it's about Christ. It's about Him and what He's doing today in the church of the body of Christ, which is completely different than what He was doing with the kingdom folks. Okay? And <clears throat> we, keep, we, keep, we keep going back to that because those are the things that, that we need to keep in mind today. Um, go back to Romans 15. <clears throat> Romans 15.1 We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So somebody that's strong in the faith is to bear the infirmities of that weaker person. Find out where they are and do that with them. Now, there was a... And I forgot to write it down. There's a verse that we brought up Friday night. And Moorhead, and I can't remember it now. I'll think of it. <clears throat> I'll think of it. It was in First Corinthians, I think, or something. Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll think of it here in a minute. And that's that's exactly what Paul was doing, right? Paul Paul identified himself with the folks there in Corinth, and he said, "I know I, I've become exactly how you are." Because I know where you are, and I know where I need to bear you up to get you to the point that you ought to be uh, in, as far as knowledge and understanding and all that. And notice he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And the strong there has to be dealing with that doctrine, the ones that are strong in doctrine, right? Um, and not to please ourselves. How often do people... How often do people do things to 
glorify themselves or to put themselves up on a pedestal. Okay, um, Look at what I've done. Right? There is something Brother Jordan said to me when we were down in La Follette. He said, anytime somebody's saying, I this or I that or I this, you always got to be careful. Now, if it's we and we and we, that's a different thing because the focus shouldn't be on me, right? I don't do blah, 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 or whatever. It's we. It's together we're doing some stuff. And that's what he's dealing with here in the local assembly is helping each other, building each other up, not tearing each other down. Um, the weird thing is that where we are in, in the world <clears throat> right now is how is it how is it possible to I'm trying to think how to say this <clears throat> local church kind of doesn't exist in a lot of places I mean for us we've got folks online that would be considered and they kind of, they consider themselves part of our group um, the church building is not the issue. It's everybody that's involved is the church, right? And so then when we start talking about the local church or local assembly, I'm talking about us here. But then we also include those that watch in online as well because we consider them part of our, our group. And so then what's, 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 really, what's really interesting is when we, when we look at how much Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff, how horrible that stuff is. But then it also gives us a platform like this to reach people that we probably will never meet this side of heaven. And so it, it's changed what the local assembly is. Um, more specific, I mean, when Paul's talking to the folks at Rome, he's talking to the folks at Rome and not to the people in Corinth because they're not there, right? It's different now. Had Paul been able to access Facebook or whatever it may be? It's weird to think about. Yeah. Um, how how much different would have this would this stuff have been? You know, and that's that's what we've got to think about in the way that that, that the world's changing now. Um, so the last. The last thing that we had was industrial revolution, right? So they're talking about what's, and then, then you had internet, which really wasn't that. But the next revolution that everybody's talking about is AI, right? Artificial intelligence. You see commercials now where people are sitting at a basketball game. They're sitting on the front row watching a basketball game, and they're sitting in their, in their couch in their house. You're... You've got food delivery places that will deliver you food from places that no long, that's never delivered food before, but they've got this company that will deliver it for you. There's going to be a point in time where there's no reason to go outside. And there's a lot of kids that are living that way right now today. And we've got to think... We've got to, what we've got to be able to do is think about where, what this is dealing with here with the local assembly and think of how is, how is the changing world around us going to be affected by what we're doing here. And a lot of those barriers are no longer there. Everybody at our old church, they used to say, we need to evangelize outside the four walls. Right there it is. Right? <clears throat> so we've got to think, how are things going to change? And how does... How does this verse now become applicable, not just for the local group here, but people that might be watching online, right? Or somebody that might be Hawaii, I mean Hawaii, right? If you're sitting out there or on the other side of the world. I mean, we, we've got people that listen in on Pow Talk from, from England, and they're able to talk to us just like we're sitting across from the table from each other. And so then when we think about those things, we, we sometimes lose sight of the local group, right? And that's, that's one of those things that, that Paul's dealing with here that we need to make sure that we keep in mind as we go forward. All the stuff, you know, what we're doing on the Internet and stuff like that is fantastic. But we always got to think about um, us too. But notice he says in verse 2, 
let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Again, <clears throat> this stronger person please neighbor to what? What's the purpose of it? For his good to edification, to build them up. Right? To build them up. As we... <clears throat> Drop down to drop down to verse twenty. <clears throat> Romans chapter fifteen, <clears throat> verse twenty. Notice he says, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as, as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they, they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey." and to be brought on the way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. The thing that we've got to think about is, the modern day Facebook at that time was writing letters. And that's exactly what, was, what, what Paul was doing there. And we see that's what he's dealing with. He's saying, I'm not going to go somewhere where Christ is already named. I'm going to go, I'm going to go places where, he's, where people don't know about him. And I'm going to do some stuff and I'm going to preach the gospel. And that's going to be what he's going to be doing. But what's he doing? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter 14, what he did is he went into every city and he preached the gospel, right? And then the second thing he did was he edified. So it's not just enough to preach the gospel and then let them go. But we don't preach the gospel and then, as, as everybody, you know, most everybody's talked about and heard, you don't win them, wet them, work them, and whip them. You win them and build them up. How do you build them up? Through the study, through understanding some stuff. You have to bear their infirmities and build them up. In fact, <clears throat> um, go over to... Pull this up earlier. Galatians. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> I thought of that verse. All right, Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Notice in verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, when we're taking a look at this, what's he dealing with? <clears throat> He's saying, brethren, if a, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. Now, this person that's been overtaken in a fault, are they a saved, or is that a saved individual or an unsaved individual? A saved individual. How do we know? He's saying, restore such an one. So what, what takes place, and we've seen this before in Galatians, Paul talks about the fact that you've fallen from grace. <clears throat> and the reason they fell from grace is because they put themselves back under the law. All right. And if you're, in a, if you're in a situation and you're putting people under the law, then you're not under grace. Okay? So then a lot of people say, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not telling somebody you have to do this, you have to do that, or whatever it may be. Um, I don't think you have a problem with, with me talking about this. Jeffrey Noonan and I were having a conversation this, uh, a couple of days ago, and <clears throat> he was telling me, you know, there's times when he feels like, am I doing what God wants me to do because my job won't allow me to do what I'm, what I'm wanting to do. Um, because of the, the, the number of hours that he has to work and, and the days that he has to work, it just it makes it hard, hard for him to do the ministry. And he's gotten to the point now where he's like, I don't know. He's like, I've got to figure out something because I want to do this ministry. I'm wanting to go through. And he started Grace School of the Bible, and he's doing all this stuff. And he's like, 
I don't want to quit those things, but I got to figure out something that I'm supposed to do. And, and he's saying, I, I'm worried that I'm not living up to God's standard or what God wants me to do. And I told him, I said, you're putting, you're putting a standard on yourself that no one's put on you. And when you put a standard or something like that that you can't, you can't fulfill, then automatically what's taking place is you're putting yourself under the law. And so then what happens is we do this all the time with each other, whether it's, whether it's something we mean to do or not. Um, the comparing ourselves with other people is the worst thing we could possibly do. And you're, and no, no, we've had this conversation because that's one of those things that you've struggled with is we cannot compare ourselves with other people. The moment that we do, we've put a burden on ourselves that we can't carry. And what takes place is we put ourselves under a law because we put ourselves, we say, here's this target that God's never made for us to begin with. That We say, here's this target and I've got to meet this target and I've already automatically set myself up for failure because I'm not going to make it. Because I look at this person or this person or this person, I'm saying, well, I'm not as whatever as this person and I'm not as whatever as this person. And so as soon as I don't match them, I've already put myself as a failure. And then what's that going to do to me? You've put yourself under law. We do it with each other all the time. We put each other under the law and we don't even realize it. And so then what's, that's what he's dealing with here. He says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Now, how is it that we go about bearing the infirmities of the, of the weaker brother is through meekness. And we've talked about that before. We, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is exactly what he talked about in the chapter before this as being one of the fruits of the Spirit. One of the things that the Spirit will do through us is produce that meekness. And then when we stop putting ourselves under that law or some, some target that we can't make or put other people on some target that they can't make and then say, I'm going to hold you up to this position and when you miss it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, put you down. I'm going to keep... And that's not what he's saying here. And here's why. Notice he says, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So don't put this person under a, under a law saying, Well, you've got to act like me. You can't eat because I'm, I know we're not supposed to eat. Um, I'm not going to do this because I know I'm not supposed to do that. We can't hold that person to the same standard. What we need to do is find out where they are in meekness and be careful because we might be taken to fault as well. And that's what he's saying there. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted to try and meet some standard that no one's put on us. And he continues on in verse 2. Here's how we do this. Bear ye one another's burdens... And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So he's saying, bear it right now. When he's talking about the fact that we're going to bear that on our own, what's he talking about there? That weak person is going to have to go and stand in front of that judgment seat of Christ. And so is that stronger person going to have to go and stand in front of and before that judgment seat of Christ. We're going to, take, we're going to, we're going to be judged of ourselves then. But what's he saying now? Until that time, help each other out. Build each other up in the doctrine. And that's what he's dealing with here. Um, I thought of the verse. <clears throat> Go back to First First Corinthians chapter two. First <clears throat> Corinthians chapter two, <clears throat> and we'll 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 see exactly what Paul's talking about. In Romans fourteen being lived out by our pattern. Okay. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter. Two. 
verse 1. <clears throat> and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So when he first starts off, what's he say? I'm not coming with really good speech, and I'm not coming at you with wisdom. He says, I'm not coming to talk about how much more I know than you do. Right? Notice, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The only thing that was on Paul's mind when he went to Corinth and wrote that book to Corinth is, do you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again? Yes, let's start there. It's not bold, it's where? He's meeting them where they are. That's all, that's all you know. You're saved, that's where we need to start. Yeah, and he's saying... And basically, you think of it this way. He's like, all right, do you know that he's crucified, that he died, was buried, and rose again for you? You know that? All right, everything else, get rid of. Because we're going to replace all the wrong thinking, all the wrong actions with truth. But he doesn't say it that way. All right, he's saying, I want to know, do you know Jesus Christ was crucified? That's all I need to worry about right now. No, he's not sitting there saying, well, you don't know how to write the divide. You don't know how to write the divide. You don't know how to write the divide. You're praying wrong. You're doing this. You're doing that. He's saying, do you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again? That's all I care about right now. All right? And what he's doing is he's, he's feeding them the milk doctrine. He tells them a little bit later on, you should already be to the point where you're able to teach this stuff, and I'm having to come back and talk about those that milk that milk doctrine okay but notice here's how he goes about doing it verse 3 and i was with you in weakness where are the folks in corinth they're weak in the faith right what's paul say and i was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of, of the Spirit and of power. All right? So when we think about this, <clears throat> he's saying, I was with you when you were weak. I know exactly the weakness that you're dealing with. I know where you were. I'm there with you. I'm there, I'm there with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Does he come along and say, I'm, I'm stronger than you. I know more than you. I'm not afraid of anything because I know that I've had all those things lifted off me and I'm not doing that. And I'm not trembling, worrying about what God, what's God going to do to me when I see Him face to face. He didn't come to Him with that. He's saying, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. What did he do? He, he, he lowered himself to where they were and said, okay, let's start at the cross. And let's start talking about some stuff. Does that remind you all of anybody that's ever done that before? When before the foundation of the world, God said in and of himself, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they were going to do something at that cross. And then we're going to accomplish something by that cross. And what took place is God took on human flesh, lived a life so that He might be a kinsman redeemer, that He would come to this cross and die a death that we can't die. He would take upon Himself the sins of the world, which we can't do. And He says, I have been made sin so that you can be made righteous. That's what Paul's dealing with there. And so God, through, through His Son Jesus Christ, did exactly what Paul's doing right here. And when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, Christ brought Himself down, and we'll see it in Philippians 2, 
he brings himself down and takes upon the form of a servant. And he is obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was obedient. He came down. God came down, met us where we were. And then he's building us up through this book, through the Bible that we have. And Paul's saying, the same thing that Christ did is what I'm doing right here in 1 Corinthians 2. I'm making myself weak and fearful and trembling for you. All right, notice and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit. So how do you demonstrate the Spirit? Well, when the Spirit works through you, you by love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, patience, all that, you do some things, the Spirit works in and through you. That's the demonstration of the capital S Spirit, right? And he says, of power. Jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse uh, 17. We'll start in verse 17. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1 17. Everybody loves this verse, but then we forget to read the rest because we just want to talk about baptism, right? Verse 17 For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be should, made of, should be made of none effect. Do you know, when he says here, preaching the gospel not with wisdom of words, the majority of churches today preach the gospel with wisdom of words. They've come up with, they've theologically and systematically destroyed the gospel by adding their thoughts, their wisdom, their mindset. And by wisdom of words, they've destroyed it, and they've brought the cross of Christ to be made of none effect whether it's Calvinism, whether it's Arminianism, whether it's covenant theology, whether it's prosperity gospel, whatever it is, they're all destroying the gospel and they're making it of none effect. And they're basically saying Christ really didn't die for anything because we're going to be able to take care of it ourselves. And notice he says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Okay, Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is of them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It is what? Power of God. Do you think that that's also that same spirit and of power that he's talking about in chapter 2? The answer is yes. Romans 1.16 tells us what? Paul says, I am ready for I am ready to preach the gospel. Right? Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. The power that Christ is, or that Paul's dealing with here is the, the, the gospel that Christ that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. He's just reiterating the fact that this is how you were saved, guys. And that power that he's talking about there is right there. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God... It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, and under, under the Greeks foolishness. But under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. When we talk about that spirit and the power that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's the issue is that gospel and the, how that gospel demonstrates the, the, or presents the demonstration of the Spirit. Uh, go back over to chapter 2, verse 5. <clears throat> Here's why he's doing things, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but he's just coming in the, in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Here's why. Verse 5, that purpose statement. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What that is, is preaching Christ crucified. That's the power of God, is preaching that, that cross work right there. Which is why years ago we decided we're going to call this cross work ministries. That's where that came from, because we want that to be the issue. Could I have been like most everybody else and just said, we'll just call it Greg Reeser Ministries? No, because the ministry is not about me. The ministry is about the cross work of Christ and the power that, that of, of, of God 
that destroys the wisdom of all men is that, that work right there. The cross is the issue. And so that's where Paul is saying, and then he gets into some meat doctrine right after that. He's saying, here's some stuff that we now know about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that God kept secret something in his mind from before the foundation of the world. Notice in verse 6, How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom of which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had Satan and his angels knew what God was going to do through the cross, they wouldn't have crucified him. And that's what, that's what Paul's dealing with here. He says, I'm going to come and meet you all in weakness and in fear and trembling. And I'm going to start here with the cross. And we're going to start talking about what the cross did for us. And then, is it, is it just a mistake that verse 9 comes right after that? <laughs> that he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared them that love him. But then verse 10 says, but, the, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. We now know why Christ was crucified. The purpose behind it. We now know it. And that's what Paul's doing. He's saying, okay, you've got this. You understand He's crucified. Now, let's talk about why. What did that accomplish? And that's when he starts getting into the meat of the doctrine. Is let's talk about why. Now that you know that, let's talk about how to write the divide the Bible. Because that's really what he's doing right there. He's saying, we now, okay, you all have got this straight. Now let's talk about what's taking place through understanding the Word of God, write the divide it. So we see the Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmities. We see how Paul accomplished that or showed us how he did that with the folks in Corinth. Now, let's take a look at uh, um, another person, Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> Romans chapter 15, <clears throat> start off in verse 1 again. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now, when we, when we think about... When we think about that list over in Romans 5, right? He says what? <clears throat> Tribulation works what? Patience. Patience works what? Experience. Experience works what? Hope. Do what? Alright, so tribulation works patience, patience experience, and experience hope, and hope make us not to be ashamed, right? And so the result of all that is not to be ashamed. There's a couple things here that, that we should think about. One, what do we notice <clears throat> what do we notice right here? Verse four For whatsoever things are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures should have what? How is it that we have hope in chapter 15 is through what? Patience and comfort of the Scriptures? Okay. Patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we've got patience there. Right? There's something else that's going to take place here as well. <clears throat> through patience and comfort of the Scriptures... 
we have what? Hope. What does hope make us not to do? To be ashamed. Does that remind you of another place where it says something about not being ashamed? 2 Timothy 2.15, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed. Right? They're dividing the word of truth. Do you know what we do with those scriptures? Do you know what makes it possible for us to not be ashamed, to have hope? If we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we apply right division principles to the scriptures and then all that stuff's going to take care of it. Do you know how that we actually do all this stuff? Do you know how all this stuff is done? Through the Word. All that stuff through the Word. Through the Scriptures that we have built up in our soul, that's the only way that this stuff's going to work. I can't in my own power get any of you all to do something, and you can't in all your power get me to do something. It's only through the power that we have through the Scriptures and the Spirit presenting Himself and doing, doing work with us that we're going to be able to do that stuff. It's only through the Scriptures. The Scriptures are the issue. And we, through those Scriptures, through right division, what we do is we find out some things and we have tribulation. Do we get, do we get bogged down here and say, woe is me? Or do we say, okay, I understand I've got tribulation. I'm going to look at it a little bit differently now and I'm going to have some patience. And I go through and I study some stuff about the scriptures and what that patience does is it creates an experience for me that I can talk to somebody else if they go through that same issue that I can talk to them about that. And what that experience does is it creates hope in me through understanding God's word rightly divided and through those scriptures I'm not ashamed. This book, the book that we have, this Bible that we have is completely different than any other book in the world. No other book in the world can do that right there. No other book in the world can, can teach you how to deal with tribulation in life. It's not, it's not uh, hashtag um, what was me, right? We find out what that tribulation, we understand that through tribulation, through those infirmities, what, through God's grace, what do we do? We're going to glory in those infirmities, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, bring it on, life. And I make proper decisions, and that creates patience in my life. You know, over in James, it talks about the fact that patience is a virtue. You know, over in Galatians 5, that's a fruit of the Spirit. And we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, <clears throat> have hope. Notice in, notice in verse 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another. What's that like-minded there have to do with? Does that say, I want you all to think about the same things the same way in the same manner and you all have to uh, agree on everything 100% of the time? That's not what he's talking about in the context. In the context here, he's talking about what? bearing other people's infirmities, well, who is it that he's saying be like-minded of? Christ. In the context, isn't that who he says? Verse 3, back up to verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself. Do you know what? You take that with verse 1. He says, the strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and to please not ourselves. And when he says here, verse, verse 3, for even Christ pleased not himself, do you know what he did? He wasn't pleasing himself. What he did is he was doing exactly what verse 1 said. He was a strong and he, he bore the infirmities of the weak. So much so that Paul even, Paul even quotes Psalm 69 verse 3 here. The reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Now you think, <clears throat> when Christ died on that, on that cross, he's saying the reproaches of them that reproached me fell on me. You know what he's doing? He was bearing the burden and the infirmities of all the weaker people. Which is who? Every one of us. And what Paul's doing here is saying, the Spirit's going to do it. We can do it with each other, but it's only because of it's for Christ's sake. But really, ultimately, the one that did it was Christ. And he's saying Christ didn't please himself, but he, he came down and took upon himself 
the form of a servant. He lived in flesh, only he didn't sin. He took upon himself the form that you and I have. He walked on this earth and he died a cruel death on the cross and he bore the infirmities of all the weak. And he's saying, go look at what Christ did. And he's saying in verse, verse 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another. He said, have the same thought process that Christ had about you toward each other. He's not he, that like-minded there. Just because we see the word like-minded doesn't mean that we're all agreeing on the same thing. He's saying, the, think exactly how Christ did. Is that possible for us to think exactly how Christ did? Well, we're told that we have the mind of Christ in this book, and when we get this book and we build it up in ourselves, can we think the same way that He did? Will I bear the infirmities of the weaker rather than putting them down? Do I look at them and say, I'm going to let you do what you're going to do, but I tell you what, there's going to be a time when, when I'm going to have to bear that infirmity for you. And we're going to have to build you up not tell you how bad you are or how horrible you are or anything like that, but we're going to say, I know exactly where you are and I'm going to take you where we need to get to together. And it's not me doing it. It's the Spirit, Christ living His life through us to do that because He's already done it. He knows exactly what it takes. He knows it takes the Word of God to be able to do that and that's the only way that we can do it. In meekness, we come to the people like this that's weak in the faith and we build them up and we show them here's the verses here's the verses here are the verses now you make a choice and we make a choice what do we do with the verses do we believe the verses or do we just wallow and stay over here and say well I'm just stuck in the rotten now and now do I go over to, to Romans chapter 7 and read the verse oh wretched man that I am and just live in that or do I go on to the next verse and talks about the fact that God's done something through His Son in my life that's taken me out of that stuff? It's easy. It's easy to be stuck in junk. <laughs> yeah, I mean we've had that we've had that conversation before. It's easy to live there, and social media has just made it easier to pull people down with you. Fortunately, they've got that little snooze for 30 days now, right? You can click on it and it'll snooze for 30 days so you don't have to hear anything from that person for at least 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's one of those things. Yeah, I mean, you, you just get bombarded with junk. You're like, snooze. We'll see if you change your mind in 30 days. 30 days you post something like, snooze. <laughs> I mean, it, but I mean, <sighs> yeah, but I mean, when we, when we think about that stuff, how many of us, instead of, instead of glorying in our infirmities, where we're weak at and understanding we're weak and agreeing to the fact that we're weak and we need to build up. How many of us are just, it's okay. I'll just be weak. I'll be a name that's named. I, at least I'm saved. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> in, order to, to, in order for us to say, for instance, me. Yeah, I mean, for instance, me. If, if, I, if, I, if I have to admit that I'm weak in some area, what do I have to deal with to say that I'm weak in some area? What issue do I have to say and deal with to, to tell people I'm weak in an area is I have to not be as prideful as I know I am. And it's a pride issue that gets in the way that says, well, I'm not weak. I already know it. And that's why, I mean, 
I can, I can think of four or five people right now that used to preach this Bible right the divided that don't do it now. And the reason why is because they were too prideful to talk about the fact that they were weak. One of them went off to the Navy. Now he denies God even exists because he chose not to say that he was weak in a position. And what he did is he did the exact opposite of what we read over in in Galatians 6. He didn't he wasn't mindful of himself that he might fall into that temptation as well. And that's what got him caught up. One of the one of the toughest things <clears throat> that I've had to deal with is And I, and I told you all this before. When we went through the Calvinism thing, the books that I read for that, do you know how easy it is to get lost in that stuff? I mean, there's a guy that used to preach down in Georgia. He was studying some stuff out. He didn't bring himself out. He's no longer preaching. We all know him. Those things... If we if we if we don't recognize where we're weak, then we can't be helped. I mean, <laughs> it's tough for me because I've I've been there, and I know and I know there's a whole bunch of other places that I know I'm weak on, um, and it's a tough thing to admit to yourself. And, and I see this all the time with kids at school. They're afraid to ask questions because they don't want to look like they're stupid. Yet, you'll say something stupid and proved it, right? What is it? Uh, was it um, Samuel Clements? What was his, what was his name? Um, was that his name? Mark Twain, yeah, his, his, his other name is Mark Twain. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. Um, isn't that what he said? <clears throat> better, better, to, uh, better to keep your mouth quiet and let people think you're full than open your mouth and prove them right. <laughs> Something like that. Is, is he the one that said that? I don't know. I'm thinking it was. Um, but, I mean, it's one of those things... It's it's a tough thing to admit that we're weak. But I mean, Paul did it. Christ did it. He knew where he was weak in the flesh. Right? He knew what he did. He knew what he was dealing with when he was in the flesh. I mean, he hungered. Right? I mean, he he's sitting in the garden. Right? Sweating great drops of blood. And what was his final decision? Not my will, but thy will be done. Do we know God's will? We ought to. We know God's will. It's all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We ought to know. And if we don't know, the Spirit's going to help us get there to understand that's what His will is. And what we say is, not my will, but thine be done. And do you know how much easier it's going to be to, to grow up? This took, we've been, we've been in, we've been in right division for what, uh, 21 years, 22 probably. Well, I'm, for you, but for me, um, 21 years. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> there were things, there were things that it took me years to figure out where I was weak. And it's tough. It was, I mean, it was a hard, it was a hard thing to do, but I just got over it eventually. And then, then I started to grow. And I, and the, the funny thing is there's so much more to go. Uh, I find it, I find it really rewarding to get into the book and find out where I am weak now. Yeah, I mean, there's there's things until I went to the Grace School of the Bible on all this stuff that I didn't know. And I mean, even then, 
taking my notes from Grace School of the Bible and then teaching this stuff, going through the book of Romans, there were things that I learned when studying to prepare for, or even that I'm up here and I'm thinking, oh wait, there's this verse that I could, I could talk about here. And there's things that I'm learning even now. As I'm teaching... Sometimes things will pop into my mind. I'm like, okay, so that verse goes with this one. And all of a sudden, it makes something a whole lot clear. And then you figure out, okay, maybe I was weak there. All right? But it's figuring out where we are. But the whole thing about what Paul's dealing with here, he's saying take care of each other is the issue. Especially in the group around you. That's what he's dealing with in verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Always keeping in mind where they are to build them up. The edification process of the believer, that's, that's what we have to keep in mind as we go on through this. Notice in, in verse 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our end goal. That's our end goal is that we're strengthened in the inner man and we're constantly helping each other become strengthened in the inner man to glorify God. That's our end goal. It's not to say, well, I'm stronger and you're weaker. And all. As I've said before, this Bible's not about me. It's not about you. It's Christ living His life through us. It's about Him. That should be what we should keep on our mind at all times. <clears throat> um, I do want to take a look a little bit more <clears throat> in that uh, verse 4 next time um, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning that through patience comfort of the scriptures might have hope um, I want to take a look at a little bit more about that <clears throat> um, kind of bear that a little bit more so I guess we'll end there for the day questions comments concerns what? Huh? Are you worried about the weather? Are you worried about your drive home, Tyler? <laughs> okay. Because you just get to sleep in the back, right? Put your puzzles together. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Monday or tomorrow night, I'll be on Pal Talk. I don't know what I'm teaching yet. I'll figure it out tomorrow I guess uh, no <clears throat> but uh, just through pal, through pal talk he's doing a little bit better they're actually able to go to their other their church so that's why they've not been on a lot here lately um, yeah yeah um, but I think he's he, he's doing a little bit better uh, he still has has a lot of pain, but it it's where he can they can still get around now, so a little bit better. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, all right. <clears throat> um, we'll pick up verse four um, next time. We'll talk about that and get into that a little bit more. All right, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we go back and study these scriptures on our own, that we might come to a clear knowledge and understanding of your word, uh, right the divided, that we can apply it to our lives, that it might glorify you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat>